Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Kenny, and welcome to ESPN Classics Top 5 Reasons You Can't Blame, a series that takes a fresh look at sports personalities who are remembered largely for their mistakes, controversial moments, or questionable decisions. Until 1972, college scholarship athletes received monthly stipends to cover some of their expenses. Then the NCAA decided not to allow them a penny. Despite its billion-dollar TV contracts, the governing body of college athletics has maintained its hard line against paying student-athletes. Meanwhile, the clamor for a return to some sort of pay system is growing louder than a post-game booster party. Let's take a look now at the rising wave of discontent with the status quo. Watch to go back deep down the middle. Got it. Got it. The value of a football scholarship today is probably uh, worth less than it was when I first started coaching. McMahon all the way back in his own 46. My scholarship check paid for my rent. That was it. My wife paid off for all my food, my clothes. It's a full-time job. If they ever start paying, maybe I'll go back. I still haven't graduated. Today's player sees jerseys with their number, sometimes with their name, being sold to fans, and they're saying, I can't even get a stipend for my laundry. Reggie Bush is uh, this tremendous player at USC. Um, they are selling thousands upon thousands of number five jerseys. It's clear that you're profiting off Reggie Bush. Why not give him a dime to buy a burger? When you come from a family that doesn't have a lot of money, um, you know, you find yourself trying to get money any way you can. If college athletes were paid a little bit more, it doesn't have to be a lot more. It doesn't have to be thousands of dollars. You wouldn't find athletes getting in trouble for NCAA violations. Jordan Farmar, Aaron Aflalo, Ryan Collins, they don't get a cut. You've got 2.5 million that you can dig up someplace for a coach, and Farmar gets nothing. He gets, he gets free baby blue sweats. It's almost un-American that they don't get something. In most big-time college football programs, the players get less than 10% in the form of scholarships. For 2005-2006, the NCAA projected income of more than half a billion dollars. All of it, like the money gained by its 1,200 college sports programs, is tax-free. He's going for the corner! He's got it! The University of Texas reported 50 million in football revenue for 04-05. The amount that was spent on player scholarships was 2 million. Now, where's the rest of that money going? These are student athletes, but they're generating a lot of money for a very rich and powerful institution in this country. And they're being exploited just like sweatshop workers. Unbelievable! That's incredible! While the NCAA gets richer, college athletes on scholarship are barely compensated beyond tuition, room, board, and books. The university make millions and millions of dollars off um, college athletics. And I think they need to give something back to the athletes. Long past the Ewing! You can get loans and Pell Grants and things like that. Those are all things I went through. Um, but still, it wasn't quite enough for me to be able to buy things that I needed. Not what I wanted, but things I needed. I had 10, 12, 13 kids on a team. They never got anything from home. Never. They didn't have no money at home. And then you couldn't work. I mean, give me a break. Every other student on campus can be an entrepreneur. They can bargain for, for more financial aid. If they're playing the tuba in the band, they can play an instrument on the weekend and make as much money as they want. We've interviewed athletes who have said they've incurred credit card debt because their scholarship doesn't pay what's known as the full cost of attendance. They look around, they see the sponsors. They look at all the advertisers. Players question when they go home, when you know they get their scholarship check, 
and they know it's not designed to cover toilet paper and soap and basic necessities like laundry. We have enough money to pay, you know, our presidents, and we have enough money to pay to pay the coaches, and we have enough money to pay everybody else who works here. But we, we, we got to draw the line somewhere. Unfortunately for the athletes, it just happens to be right there, right before it gets to them. While many college officials staunchly defend the purity of the system, others view it as institutional exploitation, whereby everyone is handsomely rewarded except the athletes. I hear uh, Miles Brand saying, we embrace commercialism. The more money we make, the better, as long as it's consistent with the educational goals of the institution. Please tell me, how is Charlie Weiss's $3 million salary consistent with the goals of education? When student athletes say, hey, what about us? They pat them on the head and say, you're an amateur. You can't do that. But really, it's a tool for the NCAA to maximize money. They're able to keep all the money for themselves. The players have no rights whatsoever. They can't transfer schools freely. They don't get any money. They can't do anything whatsoever to capitalize on their celebrity. It's almost in the form of enslavement. You get these kids, you get them in a program. You put them in a program where they don't have enough money to take care of themselves. I think this is just absolutely terrible. The arguments for a pay system look pretty cut and dried, right? Well, as you'll see over the next half hour, it's not that simple. Before we count down the top five reasons you can't blame the NCAA for not paying student athletes, here are a few reasons that didn't make the cut. We call them the best of the rest. Psychology 101. The mother load for academic diversity is the model for athletic departments. Intercollegiate athletics works just the way the rest of higher education works. Psych 101 is a big money maker for higher education. So in order to have upper level classes, you have to take the revenue that you generate from Psych 101, from survey courses, from large lecture courses. It is the ambition of every athlete to break a world's record. There was no money in track and field for Jesse Owens. There was no money in golf for Jack Nicklaus. But people came to our football games, so they came to our basketball games. That was property of the institution. The institution then distributed to provide educational assistance for lots of men and then for lots of women. If you're a smart coach, you understand that you've got to pull for football because they carry all of us. And a kick is you, know, you want football to have sellouts. You want them to get great TV revenue so your sport can have a little more leeway on recruiting budgets and travel budgets. This is the redistribution of revenue. That money is used to help support all kinds of other sports so volleyball players and soccer players and tennis players and golf players can get a chance to play in NCAA tournaments. Our final best of the rest, President Theodore Roosevelt. His football intervention in 1905 set a high standard for college athletics. In 1905, 18 players were killed in college football. And there was a move afoot to abolish the game. President Theodore Roosevelt, he supported football, but he thought there needed to be rule changes. Out of his uh, warnings came the NCAA, came the decision to have a national governing body for intercollegiate athletics, and it was something that needed to be done. The one thing that Teddy Roosevelt and the current NCAA share is a very strong reverence for competition. And the NCAA rules are intended to level the playing field. Using its power of mandate, the NCAA seeks to enforce rules of amateurism in order that the cradle of education isn't rocked by the forces of corruption. There isn't pay for play because it would completely violate the mission of intercollegiate athletics and of higher education. Richard Nixon. When the president signed Title IX into law January 23rd, 1972, he not only dramatically altered the face and form of collegiate sports, he also strengthened the argument against providing additional financial assistance to athletes. You know, it's amazing Title IX passed under the Nixon administration. It looked a little innocuous, and you can't discriminate on the basis of sex in any institution that receives federal funding. It's a federal law. Title IX, equal rights between men and women. You can't give a player $500 a month because he can run 4-6. You got to give the woman lacrosse player $500 a month. 
So forget it. That ain't never going to happen. I'm not sure how you get Title IX involved in paying these athletes. Joe Kim Noah has to get paid, so the Florida women's dive team have to get paid. Title IX is going to be the ultimate fly in the ointment. The idea that we would just do it for the revenue-producing sports has been put forward, but that would mean instant lawsuits from 5,000 different women's organizations, and they would have a legitimate point. There's not the money there to pay softball. It can't be free market. You can't just pay somebody whatever, because then you're going to have 30 programs, and the rest of the programs are only going to fall off the map. Three from Charlotte Smith. She hit it! She hit a three-point basket! The Tar Heels are national champions! It's really been years of modification, making certain that there are equitable opportunities for your daughter. So thank you, Richard Nixon. Are you starting to change your thinking? Maybe reason number four will help. The arms race. Paying players would escalate the recruiting wars. Free agency would run rampant. It will result in the demise of college sports as we know it. The arms race in college athletics is one of the biggest recruiting tools out there. Everybody wants the biggest and the sleekest and the nicest weight room. They want the player's lounge hooked up with Xbox 360, high-def television. It's one of the things, I think, that keeps athletic departments from being more profitable. Their stipend levels would be just one more uh, element of what some people would call an arms race. If you go to a true model of pay for play, who's going to be paid and how much they're going to be paid is going to become part of the competition. May galloping down the lane with a two-handed slam. The result, the big income schools would become even bigger fish in the talent pool. You're going to have the smaller schools who aren't going to be able to have the, the revenue that comes in versus the bigger schools whose students are going to get paid, you know, 50 grand. Then all of a sudden it becomes, well, what school pays more? It'll be a huge mess. You could take a school like a USC versus a Morehouse, and they may maybe give a kid $2,000 a month. When I say at Morehouse, we can only give you 100 Well, who's going to get the athlete? Most people blame the MCA, NCAA. They make a fundamental flaw. They think we're all alike. And here are the Michigan Wolverines. University of Hartford has 7,000 students. We wouldn't even fill a corner of Michigan Stadium. The truth is, of 350 schools that play Division I sports, maybe 25 break even. Everybody else loses a lot of money. The athletes have no fear. No, not that fear. Donald fear. And obviously, there would have to be continued negotiations. Donald fear is one tough SOB. He's a tough guy to deal with. Major League Baseball's union boss, who rules with an iron fist, has leveraged unprecedented benefits for his clients. I was a member of that union for a long time. And when they said jump, you said how high? It's the strongest union in the, in, in the world, in all business, is the baseball union. Well, it never got to the point where we saw settlement as being close. If Donald Fear were in charge, first, there wouldn't be any drug testing of the athletes, that's for sure. They'd all be getting paid. I could also see them striking if Donald Fear were in charge of college athletics. If this guy would cancel the World Series, he certainly would cancel the MicronPC.com Bowl if he wasn't getting enough money. It's going to take some well-versed student athletes in world affairs, in the world of negotiating, or maybe a Donald Fear, to come in and say, what are you guys doing? You guys are an incredibly profitable business, and you guys, you are the product. And the only way to get your way is to withhold services. Ultimately, if the players don't play, nobody makes money. And that's, that's, the, that's the leverage student athletes have. One day, there'll be time for a national championship game to be played. And there will be uh, football players in a locker room that are willing to say to one another, everybody's making a lot of money here. What, what about us? It crossed my mind many a times while I was in school, you know, to uh, kind of unionize players to really make an effect on how money is distributed. Everyone else in college sports has an organization of their own. There's no 
independent union or organization speaking for athletes. In 1980, we actually got an organization funded by the, uh, the federal government. We were going to revolutionize things. We were going to change the NCAA. We were organizing labor unions. The organization, known as the Center for Athletes' Rights in Education, died broke less than two years after it was formed. Since 2001, the Collegiate Athletes Coalition, backed spiritually and financially by the United Steelworkers Union, has been demanding a chair at the NCAA bargaining table. They asked for help and we stepped up to the plate to help them. If a group of workers uh, are being exploited, then that damages all of us. We're basically the voice for the college athletes. There's some things that need to be taken care of that needed to be taken care of for a long time. We need those changes made. They got it band together and get it done. Nobody's going to do it for them. If you haven't bought into our argument yet, maybe reason number two will help. College presidents, they make the rules. You can't blame the NCAA for not passing legislation that would increase the size of a scholarship because the national office of the NCAA has no authority for doing that. The presidents have the final say they're on the board of directors. There's a handful of them. They rotate. They have all the power. You blame the colleges and universities around the country whose representatives make those decisions through voting. I think that the presidents should move boldly and quickly to cover the full cost of attendance, not just room and board and books. I think they're trapped because now they have these huge budgets and they're required to fund all the scholarships. We've created this monster now. We have to keep it going or the whole thing collapses. You know, when you talk to the school officials, they say, hey, hey, we're with you. You know, we, we think we should be able to do this for you and that for you. But hey, we, our hands are tired. It's the NCAA. Well, they're the NCAA. President Brand has, in fact, advocated for increasing the value of, of the scholarship. But remember that these are decisions that aren't made by President Brand. He's not the czar of intercollegiate athletics. The college presidents bear more responsibility because they should have the kind of courage to stand up. They are paid. A free college ride is priceless. I can't blame the NCAA for not wanting to pay college athletes because they're paying them one of the greatest gifts of all, which is a free education. Education has a value. They are being paid. If you get a scholarship, it is extremely important that you understand that it has a money value to it. The average cost of a year at a public university is more than $12,000 a year and nearly $30,000 a year at a private college. Saying who gets the better deal, Brady Quinn or Notre Dame, is kind of like saying who gets the better end of the deal, Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt. They're both getting a pretty good deal here. See, that's where we have this disconnect in college sports. I mean, they're going there to get an education first, but we've, that's, that whole concept has been lost, and they don't put any value on the fact that they're getting a free education. If they got the scholarship and they put in the time, they should be able to walk out of there with a, a great set of life skills that will allow them to succeed, whether they continue in sports or they uh, pursue their careers elsewhere. You grow up a lot through college, and I think a lot of kids miss out on that. You think about it, you know, you learn so much in college about responsibility, about trusting certain people. It's so great. It's the best experience ever. To cover emergencies and some campus incidentals, the NCAA established a fund in 2003. When we could not send a kid home because his mother died to go to her funeral, that was awful. But now those things don't happen. The NCAA has provided a fund. It is a fund that right now is almost $25 million a year to cover costs that aren't already covered. Paying for insurance, uh, paying for their parking permits on campus, which could be pretty expensive. The concept that there are student athletes who can no longer get a winter coat that they need simply doesn't exist. I never would have been able to go to college had I not been a football player. And I went to Northwestern, one of the finest. So I had a career. I knew what I was going to do when I finished playing football. This is not a right, man. It's a privilege. You don't have to be here. If somebody's interested in college, they want to go to school, they want to accept room board fees and tuition, that's great. And if they don't, um, 
go to the Boston Celtics or the, or the, the Rockford Lightning. For many of them, they're not going to play after uh, college anyway, and, and that education is extremely important to them. For the win, God, touchdown! What a deal. Should we be paying salaries beyond that? Absolutely not. Well, there you have it, the top five reasons the NCAA shouldn't pay student-athletes. Did we change your mind? Well, one thing is certain. While the debate continues, the NCAA will continue to reap enormous profits. I'm Brian Kenny. Thanks for watching.